to the next screen. Okay, so according to the program, we move on to the portfolio monitor. Well, first you will have a presentation about the open air research graph and then monitor dashboards, call explorer, open citations, open ATC and usage counts. Uh, so we are waiting for Claudio now to share his screen. So thank you. I'm Claudio Azzori. Uh, greetings from Pisa in Italy. I work for the National Research Council and I'm going to give a brief presentation of uh, the open air research graph. This, uh, you, uh, you heard uh, about the open air research graph many times already today, so I hope I'm going to clarify a bit uh, what it is about. So the headline here is putting research into context and making the connections. So why uh, connections and uh, context are so important? We can define uh, with a very generic definition of uh, the open air graph as a collection of metadata records describing objects that have a role in the research life cycle, along with uh, the relationships among them. Uh, this is a very high level definition, of course, uh, and I'll, I'll try to, to get a bit more into the details. On the left, on the right here, instead, you can see the principle that guides the realization of uh, the open air research graph. And they basically uh, materialize in uh, the current content acquisition policies. So it aims to be an open collection of metadata records. It has to be as much as complete as possible, meaning that it should con include all the trusted and known sources that have an, a role in uh, the research life cycle. It has to be the duplicated uh, because it has have not to contain ambiguities in uh, the way statistics are calculated over it. It had to be transparent, including provenance information for the different bits of information it includes. It must support a participatory approach, meaning that it should not uh, be the result of a closed network of uh, contributions. It had to be decentralized in a sense that uh, the ownership of the contents stays uh, where um, the material is deposited. So in repositories, open air aggregates metadata records, so bibliographic descriptions. The full text in these metadata records stays owned by the original repositories and have to be, uh, of course, trusted. So uh, an important goal in the realization of the open air research graph is the control or the quality of the metadata records. So, uh, next slide. Here we can see a very high level definition of uh, the basic data model. It has at its center research products, so which are declined in as publications, data sets, software, and what we call other research products. So objects that do not fall under uh, other categories. Research products are then linked to uh, funding uh, from projects, which are further categorized by funding streams and uh, projects in which organizations uh, participate. So from this model, a uh, conceptual view of the model, the graph is materialized according to the different use cases. Few numbers about uh, the open air research graph. Currently, it includes uh, 23 funders, more than uh, 78,000 content providers, direct and indirect content providers is what mentioning here. Uh, more than 3 million projects from Europe and beyond. Uh, 123 million publications, uh, different case of software, uh, 40 millions of research data and 8 million of other research products. But these numbers here are just the tip of the iceberg as uh, the amount of data uh, actually uh, contributing to the graph is much higher as this is just the result of the aggregation and the disambiguation task. So why to use uh, the open air research graph? The three main pillars uh, motivating uh, the usage of the graph uh, boils down on the need to uh, 
tackle reproducibility and transparency that requires to tracking all the research outcomes and the relative uh, context. So the coverage of the scientific objects, the scientific outputs uh, that are in the graph, it's important. Monitoring the quality and the impact of the open science movement has to be a transparent and reproducible uh, process for all, including uh, the research context. And of course, discovery of a reproducible, reproducible science outcomes have to uh, enable new, new way to discover these products. So not only uh, articles related to a topic, but uh, exploiting the context surrounding a given research output. So the relationship it has with other uh, edges in, in the graph enables to define uh, new services and new discovery capabilities. So who are uh, the users that are interested in using the graph? Typically, as uh, my colleagues will present uh, later, content providers, publishers, funders, institutions, research infrastructure, and so on, are uh, the use cases around the typical users that define it, the use cases for the implementation of uh, the open air services in the open air portfolio. I'm going to illustrate a bit, uh, so not to take away the floor to them, uh, use cases around perhaps what is most interesting for data scientists, so how to access the data in the open air research graph. So it can be accessed in essentially in two ways, as programmatic access to uh, through API open air U and as uh, Paolo mentioned just a couple of minutes ago, as data dumps on uh, Zenodo, on which uh, periodically OpenR publishes different perspectives uh, of the graph. Funded products, uh, products related to research initiatives and research communities, products related to the COVID-19 uh, case, Scolix links from uh, Scol Explorer, uh, dump of uh, linked open data, and the full uh, open air research graph that includes the different entities uh, mentioned before. So uh, on the develop portal, develop open air U, there is uh, the documentation available to uh, know how to consume uh, the open air APIs. So the different facets of the API are described there. Uh, you can go on the portal and uh, learn more about these, how to use uh, the Open Air APIs. While uh, instead on, on, on Zenodo, since it was mentioned again a couple of minutes ago, there is a community uh, dedicated to host the different uh, dumps that uh, are regularly published uh, more or less every six months. Uh, the complete version of the Open Air Research Graph gets updated there, so you will be uh, always available to download this fairly large collection of data and uh, further analyze it. So how is it positioned uh, in the open air ecosystem? This picture was already shown and uh, highlights which is the full uh, processing pipeline implemented in open air that starts from the left from uh, data sources, including Zenodo, Argos, Amnesia, and all the thousands of repositories that contribute to open air. Uh, you can see also Microsoft Academic, Orchid, and Crossref here contributing to uh, what we call a first materialization of the graph named row, which is then disambiguated in order to identify uh, different manifestations of, of the same uh, research output, for example, a preprint and a postprint, we don't want to count them twice for the statistical analysis. Then uh, the graph gets enriched thanks to uh, text and data mining algorithms uh, available in the system that relies on the information available in the graph itself. So uh, many algorithms leverage on the abstract and uh, the full text whenever is it available to infer new links, for example, references to projects, and uh, extra properties uh, like subject classification terms. Finally, the graph gets materialized in different uh, 
uh, backends that serve the different services and use cases that we implement on top of it. So uh, we can say that the graph is, uh, plays the role of the backbone of many uh, open air systems, providing data to uh, different perspectives. So the use case is basically a different way to look at the same data. So what you should remember about this presentation, a uh, few points. So what the, the open air research, the research graph is, uh, an open metadata collection of interlinked and cross-discipline scientific products with open access information linked to funding, research communities, and much more. It placed the ground on top of which different services in open air portfolio are built. And you can find more at the dedicated uh, website graph opener you and uh, that's all thank you for your attention if you have questions uh, just write them thank you Claudio uh, we also have a dedicated q a at the end so let's move on to the next uh, presenter for the next yeah one. we can move on to school explorer Sandro Good morning, everyone. I'm Sandro Labruzzo from CNR in Italy, and the, the, the responsible of the Skull Explorer service. So uh, what is Skull Explorer? So Skull Explorer is a service that provides access to a graph of links between data sets and literature objects, and also between data sets and data set objects. Uh, these links are, are, are vested from different scholarly communication sources, then they are uh, resolved because, because sometimes the links are uh, only um, a reference to a, a persistent identifier, harmonized and deduplicated. Furthermore, uh, links are exported using um, a standard format that is uh, scholix.org and the service is accessible also via REST API. Um, why you have to use a Skull Explorer? Um, because um, linking research data with literature is a, a great value, but sometimes there are um, there are a lot of problem in uh, exporting the these uh, uh, links because uh, sometimes there are. Um, uh, bilateral accords between the publisher and data centers because the links uh, refer to different uh, persistent identifiers. Sometimes you have uh, uh, the the links refer to a UI, sometimes to its accession number, and uh, the the links are uh, exported in different way. Um, so. Uh, Skull Explorer tried to aggregate links from different data sources, exported in a standard way, and uh, allows scholarly communication data sources to share links with any consumer and uh, gives also the possibility to, uh, to find all the links related to its product uh, because uh, you can resolve on the fly. The, the persistent identifier and find uh, uh, which are the entities related to. Um, this is possible uh, because, uh, as I said, Skull Explorer makes the resolution of the persistent identifiers and uh, also uh, exploiting the, the duplication, we can also infer new links because, uh, for example, in this case, if you uh, if we found that these two data sets are the same, we can infer two links between uh, different uh, persistent identifier. Um, some numbers uh, we harvest uh, from something like 22 data sources. We have uh, 50 million of data sets. 40 million of that of publication around and 900 million of relationships that are um, exported as the same in a standard Scolix metadata format. You can access the uh, this graph of links through the API. Uh, we have an API. We have something like 10 million of requests per day. Uh, and um, we also publish uh, the, the um, a data dump on Zenodo every six six months, more or less. 
Um, where Skull Explorer is positioned position in the open area ecosystem, Skull Explorer is a part of the, the open air research graphs, so it provides links to the open air research graph. At the moment, they are two different systems, but in the future, will be one uh, only will be a, a converging a single system. And Skull Explorer should be a view of the links inside the open air research graph. Uh, what you should remember about this presentation is that Skull Explorer uh, provides an open uh, metadata collection of links between uh, data sets and literature objects, and also between data sets and data set objects, and uh, not, not only contains the persistent identifiers, DDOI, but we trying to resolve and get all the possible persistent identifiers like accession number and uh, other types of identifiers. You can find uh, more information at our website. And thank you. I think I am done with the presentation. Thank you very much, Sandro. Uh, if you have any questions, please use the chat. Yes. Um, Sandro is here to answer. And we can continue with open citations. Silvio? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Maybe. Great. So let me try to share my screen. So um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Silvio Peroni. I am a computer science researcher at the University of Bologna, where I work as associate professor. And I'm co-director of Open Citation together with, uh, with uh, David Shutton. So what is Open Citation? Um, very briefly, we can uh, say that Open Citation is an infrastructure organization dedicated to the publication of open bibliographic and citation data. We use semantic web technologies for storing and providing this data to, to the user, in particular RDF, OWL and Sparkle as query language for uh, running queries upon this data. All the services that we offer are free and uh, open. Uh, we have made available uh, different ways to access the, the citation data that we have, uh, REST APIs, Sparkle endpoints, and visual interfaces. And in addition to that, all the data that we publish are um, totally available uh, online and can be downloaded in bulk. We provide every uh, two months, more or less, um, new um, releases of uh, the data that we host in open citations. And in 2020, just to mention something uh, that happened past year, we got uh, more than 23 million requests to our REST API that currently is the most used service for accessing uh, our data. Um, why to use our services? Well, uh, we, we have uh, uh, created open citations in order to liberate some sort of uh, facts that should be open in, in, uh, to, to the community, indeed citations coming from a research article. The idea is to uh, make uh, research evaluation exercises more transparent and reproducible by opening uh, these data and also saving a lot of uh, euros uh, to institutions that usually, uh, of course, pay a lot of euros for accessing commercial uh, services to getting exactly the same amount of data. Uh, one of the points we are uh, very proud of is that all the data that we provide, citations data that we provide, can be reused for any purpose. Indeed, we use uh, the CC0, Creative Commons 0 uh, waiver to make available this data to the community. And so uh, anyone can reuse the data uh, for any purpose, for developing new services, for instance, to monitor research, to improve the discoverability of research projects of a specific institution, of a specific researcher, of a research group, and this kind of activities. Thus, our, our goal is indeed to add to, to the user of EOSC exactly um, value for uh, reaching this specific goal of, of monitoring and discoverability. Currently, we have uh, available in our, in our system more than 759 million citations, number that is now growing thanks to uh, recent actions from existing publishers such as Elsevier, the American Chemical Society, just to mention uh, 
some of them that recently have released their reference list in the open through Crossref, something that we are now processing. And so this number of uh, citation that we have will, uh, uh, will grow a lot in the next month. Uh, and the goal that we have is basically to help any, any person that may be involved for some reason, being research, monitoring, uh, uh, for, for providing information about articles in particular, uh, such as research, uh, authors, students, administrators, and librarians. So there is a huge amount of users within the scholarly community that can benefit from the services and the data that we make available. Um, the, let's say there are different ways for, use, for using our, our citation data. As I anticipated, the most used one is the uh, REST APIs. Uh, we have a bunch of REST APIs that allow uh, a user to access different collections that we provide. There are also Sparkle endpoints that allow to make more uh, complex query upon this data. And of course, dumps, that is something that uh, is uh, used a lot, at least in the, in the past month. Uh, a lot of dumps are, are being downloaded and we provide them in three different, different formats, CSV, RDF, and also Scolix. Um, just a very quick a visual example of what you can do by using the REST API. For instance, you can ask uh, to get all the citations that are received, have been received in the past from a specific article identified by a DOI. You can do exactly the same thing for the references. So the citation that a specific DOI is doing to other articles. Uh, we have uh, operations for getting the citation counts of a specific uh, DOI and these kind of things. Uh, with Sparkle, as I anticipated, you can run a more complex query. This is just a very simple example of one of the queries that you can run by using Sparkle. For instance, you can get all the uh, articles that are co-cited together uh, with another article that you specify as input, uh, having, for instance, the DOI that I'm showing in the slide. So these and other possible queries are, of course, possible. Sparkle is uh, very, very flexible from, from this perspective as a query language. Uh, and by using these, these service that we made available, there are uh, third parties that I have started to develop some applications uh, by using our data, uh, using the, the REST API or the Sparkle endpoint, or just downloading the, the full dump of the, of the data in order to provide additional service upon this data. These are only a bunch of options. Uh, I've been developed some tools for uh, getting the, the citation count of papers that are, are visualized within a browser. Open Access Helper is one of these services. Uh, Boss Viewer is, uh, um, a tool developed for scientometrics research that allow you to, to, to show the, the, the map of science according to a specific uh, citation network that can be retrieved in some, in, in, from some sources and open citations API are used exactly in this tool for retrieving uh, the citation data for creating this wonderful visualization. And also there are, uh, let's say, uh, repositories of uh, bibliographic information that are using citation data from open citations like Insightful for getting and building the graph and exposing some information about uh, a given and provided DOI or, or, uh, or keyword. Uh, about our current position in the house, just to say that we are, uh, we are new to the gang. Uh, we are one of the additions uh, who, that started uh, thanks to Open Air Nexus. So our uh, more close relation that we, we, we will have is of course with the Open Air Research Graph. Since we are producing, we are uh, exposing a graph of citations of articles to article citations, our uh, more suitable, let's say, uh, position uh, within, setting within the, the uh, Open Air uh, Nexus project and also within the EOSC is the close interaction with the open air search graph. Of course, we, we, and by means of this interaction, of course, our data can be used by uh, all the plethora of other services that have been presented in the previous presentations. Uh, as takeaway message, very, very quickly, um, open citation, as open citations, we, we publish a global scholarly open citation data that can be reused for uh, any purpose. All the data that we publish are uh, licensed with a CC0 waiver. 
Uh, we have uh, several services, but in particular REST APIs, Sparkle endpoints, and dumps that can be used to gather citation data from our system. And currently, we are hosting more than 700. Uh, 59 million uh, of citations in our our system but we are processing new ones so more will be released uh, pretty soon uh, in open citations and i think that's basically all thank you thank you very much silvio uh, there are some questions i see in the chat so it would be nice if you can answer in the chat also and yes, afterwards course. in the q a so my name is Jochen Schurwagen from Bielefeld University Library in Germany, and um, I will talk about the OpenAPC initiative and service. Um, OpenAPC was initiated in 2014 um, by the German Initiative for Networked Information, and since then it is developed and operated at uh, Bielefeld University. The aim of OpenAPC is to collect and aggregate and publish um, fee and cost information on open access publishing uh, from, yeah, we say participating institutions. So those institutions that um, deliver us their coast data. Um, <clears throat> so initially the focus of the service uh, was on article processing charges, so-called APCs. That's why um, the service is named Open APC, but um, today it covers <clears throat> even more um, kinds of, of coast data. Um, OpenAPC um, allows for web-based visualizations for uh, end users, but also offers an API, um, so-called OLAP cubes for online analy analytical processing. The service itself is uh, free to use, uh, source code is released on um, GitHub, and the data sets are made um, available under an open database license. Um, the data set on OpenAPC um, covers around um, 118,000 um, articles uh, with an aggregated sum of um, publishing fees of over 232 million euros. And the data is um, contributed uh, from over two, uh, from around 282 organizations. Um, why the majority um, is from Europe. So why to use OpenAPC and who are the stakeholders? Um, the aim is to make um, the developments, the coast developments in the field of open access publishing uh, more transparent and comparable. And in this way, um, OpenAPC complies with also with current recommendations um, for cost transparency. Um, for instance, um, there's also a principle in, in the Plan S uh, initiative uh, from the funders and coalition S. And it's um, very helpful for them um, as it offers funders um, a potential to, to standardize and also to cap um, fee payments um, to avoid that um, the prices um, <clears throat> are steadily growing. And another um, example is also the um, report from, from the ex expert group to the European Commission on the future of scholarly publication and, and scholarly communication. Today, OpenAPC releases data sets not only on article processing charges, but also since last summer, uh, it collects um, cost information related to uh, open access monographs, so-called book processing charges, and also tries to um, collect um, information on so-called open access transformative agreements, which is a quite uh, tricky and, and complex um, task. The service is aimed for uh, libraries and funding agency agencies, but uh, also researchers and developers, for instance, the domain of information sciences or bibliometrics, in order to keep track and provide um, access to the open access record of expenditures for publishing fees and other kind of cost data. Um, OpenAPC can be used uh, via a web uh, user interface, uh, which is using uh, tree maps for, to, to visualize um, the distribution of um, a coast among institutions, publishers, and journals, or books. 
Another way is to use um, the REST API, API of the OLAP server. Um, and the third um, possibility is to access data sets on GitHub directly as CSV files. Here's an example um, of a tree map um, where a user can, can browse and inspect the APC data set. As you can see, there are a couple of options um, of use. At the moment, we see the institutions, but you can also uh, switch to, to publisher to a publisher view uh, or a view about the, the journals. And uh, a couple of filter op options uh, by time period, um, by the um, status if it is um, it reflects only coast information from good open access uh, uh, journals are also hybrid journals and um, by country. Also, it's possible to embed um, the tree map in our own, um, web pages. The second example is uh, how to query the OLAP server. Um, OLAP server um, the concept of, of an OLAP server is based on cubes, which is, uh, in this case, a Python framework for reporting and analytical applications. And in case of OpenAPC, each cube represents um, coast data from uh, contributing or participating institutions, but it can also represent um, all aggregated data, for instance, for the, um, for the journals, for the publishers. Um, the API offers um, several um, operations, like to list um, entries by institutions, for instance, or by journals, uh, and also offers a couple of aggregation um, functions, um, as shown here in this example, um, where um, <clears throat> there's a query to, to aggregate the coast information in a time period from 2014 to 2016. And the result is a JSON file, um, which provides the coast information of APCs, um, the number of articles, um, the average um, uh, sum of the coast information, and the standard deviation. So how is uh, OpenAPC positioned in EOSC and the OpenAI ecosystem? It is um, positioned in, in the OpenAI ecosystem, and this way um, it will become uh, a part of the EOSC um, ecosystem. Um, ghost data contributing inf institutions like libraries or consortia um, provide um, their data files to uh, open APC with the coast information and with uh, information about the related um, application metadata. And open APC then aggregates this information, um, enrich it, it with uh, further publication attributes from several citation databases, and makes the data sets available to the um, ingested to the open air research graph. And this way, um, it will be um, one of the components in the um, open air monitor services portfolio. The takeaway message is that OpenAPC um, contributes to uh, transparent and reproducible monitoring of fee based open access publishing, uh, which is across institutions and uh, nations or countries. And the data sets are uh, regularly uh, released on uh, GitHub. Um, on these dimensions of fees paid for open access articles and monographs on the one side and on the other side, uh, it provides coast data from transformative agreements with publishers. And um, today, um, the APC data set um, yeah, covers, as I already said, over 180,000 articles um, with fees um, of over 232 million euros, and the data is currently contributed um, from over 280 institutions. Thank you very much, and um, I hope there are a couple of questions or comments. Great. Thank you very, very much, Joachim. Uh, I see some questions uh, also from more speakers. Yes, they have some... already been answered. Okay, I see fantastic. You. Yes, don't worry. So I hope now Dimitris with usage counts has a good stable internet connection. So uh, I'm Dimitris Pirakos. Uh, I'm uh, I work for Athena Research Center, and I, the usage count service is the uh, usage statistics service of a open air uh, research graph. 
what the service does is to collect um, usage data, use statistics reports uh, for, open air, for open air research graph products and uh, for an open air uh, distributed network of repositories using open standards uh, and protocols. In other words, it simply counts and collects the number, of, uh, the number uh, an item from the open air research graph is, is viewed uh, or download. And the source of this, this formation is uh, institutional repositories, uh, data repositories, national aggregators, etc. The outcome of uh, the, this uh, process is the generation of reliable, consolidated and comparable uh, usage metrics, which are compatible with uh, standard uh, provided by counter, the counter code of practice uh, standard. The engagement of the service can be shown by indicators like the number of research products that are uh, counted, uh, 300, uh, 3, uh, 5 million research products that, uh, that we uh, count their usage from uh, two, almost 200 content providers. And we have collected 100 million views and 380 uh, million um, downloads. Uh, um, just a quick uh, presentation, introduction of how we do it. We follow two approaches. The push approach uh, that collects anonymized, that we use it to collect anonymized uh, usage row activity. And the push approach uh, to collect uh, standardized uh, user statistics uh, reports. We combine information from uh, both approaches in our uh, user statistics uh, database. And we publish uh, the results in uh, interfaces like uh, uh, explore or provide or um, uh, uh, we made them available for retrieval using the uh, SUSI Lite API uh, standard protocol. So why to use the service and uh, who can use it, who can benefit from the service? And uh, usage count service, we consider usage count service as a measure, uh, as a measure of uh, scholar um, impact. The importance of, we consider that the importance of a research item is directly related to um, its uh, uh, usage. Therefore, uh, user statistics uh, provide a kind of an indicator that complements uh, other traditional alternative bibliometric in indicators. And uh, they provide a comprehensive and uh, most importantly, recent view of the impact of, uh, uh, the, of an academic resource. So who can use the service? Who are the stakeholders of the service? Uh, they could be authors, institutions, open science platforms, funders, uh, etc. And uh, they can find information like um, which funder has the biggest engagement in Europe or give me the evolution of the popularity of the publications or data uh, of a project within um, the last uh, five uh, years. An important feature is that uh, by combined with the metadata duplication uh, functionality offered by Open Air Research Graph, it enables the accumulation of usage uh, for same research outputs. For example, uh, in other words, it provides indicators uh, for the use of, of an item across um, all the content providers for, uh, from which the item uh, has been uh, uh, harvested. And finally, the service operates towards a standardization scheme like the counter code of practice release four that is offered now and uh, soon for the release five of this um, standard. So how to use um, usage counts? You have to register uh, via provide and you can view uh, user statistics in either provide, explore or the dedicated service portal uh, usage counts. And uh, you can retrieve counter reports by the SUSI Light API interface, which is also offered in the dedicated uh, service uh, portal usage counts openn.eu. Uh, more details about the registration. We offer instructions for, um, to install the service specifically for various platforms like DSpace, uh, Inpri or ePrints. And we are also offering um, a generic Python uh, script that uh, could be applied, can be deployed in any other uh, platform and collect um, uh, users activity. Um, so um, uh, in, in provide, you can also view um, uh, some uh, results uh, from the user uh, accounts service and user statistics. Similar results you can also find in uh, Explore or um, uh, user account portal. But in Explore, uh, you could also, we could also uh, find um, an important feature of the uh, service, which is mentioned before, um, which is the accumulation of users for the same item across uh, uh, repositories. 
for example, you can see that for this particular publication, um, we, you can have aggregated uh, user statistics, but we also split um, uh, the, the, this information in, the, in two different uh, repositories from which this um, uh, publication has been uh, uh, collected. Finally, the service offers a, a standard a, a API, which is based on the SUSI Lite uh, protocol, where you can retrieve um, uh, information for the usage of uh, either for a, um, a, a, a publication or an item or a, a particular uh, repository. The service, how is the service is positioned in open air ecosystem, in open air infrastructure? Um, as mentioned before, the service is part of the monitor portfolio and it counts the usage of the research products, which are the main entities of the uh, open air uh, research graph. Uh, these entities are created um, uh, by the duplication, uh, harvesting, and mining uh, uh, um, uh, services of open air research graph and collected from content provider like. Uh, uh, institutional repositories, aggregators, uh, data archives, etc. And uh, the usage count service counts the usage of these um, research uh, products. So as a takeaway message, usage counts provide standards for usage statistic exchange for almost all type of content providers and platforms. It complies to the counter code of practice uh, and allows uh, to the exchange of reliable and comparable um, uh, user statistics reports. Um, it follows the GDPR guidelines and provides uh, in order to respect the user's privacy. It offers global coverage. We support uh, institutional repositories, uh, content providers from all around the globe. And it supports analysis via APIs and visualizations. And if you need uh, further information, you can uh, uh, find it in uh, our uh, portal, at the service portal, usagecounts.openair.eu. So this is more or less the presentation of the service. Uh, thank you for your attendance. And uh, if you have uh, any questions, please go ahead and try to reply. Now let's move on with uh, Ioana and monitor dashboards. So I'm going to talk about the open air monitor that some of you may know already. So the purpose of the monitor is to provide the tailor-made customizable monitoring uh, of uh, research and uh, innovation activities and their impact. The idea is that uh, it's an on-demand service where you can uh, create your own monitoring dashboard with our help that it's uh, highly customizable in terms of organization and viewing of different indicators. And the purpose would be, as I said, to, to emphasize, to track research activities, for example, projects and publications and so on, and uh, their impact uh, across different uh, dimensions. You can also view the public dashboards of other stakeholders. As a monitoring tool, uh, the purpose besides monitoring is of course to be used for policy making uh, by means of evaluating uh, past performance in order to decide for the future and also of storytelling. And we have added on several functionalities to make sure that uh, the visualizations can also be used for reporting purposes and the data for internal analysis of uh, the different indicators. So let me get into the, a little bit more into the functionalities uh, that we added in order to satisfy all these purposes. So, the indicators rely, are based on the open air research graph. So on uh, the duplicated entries harvested from several sources and uh, text mined. Uh, they are uh, well documented and they're meant to be timely and uh, reliable. And you're able to download both the data and the visualizations of the indicators. There are also filtering functionalities uh, that apply to your downloads as well. And uh, I'm going to emphasize again the fact that these are customizable in the sense that besides the fact that you can group yourself the indicators to categories of interest, uh, since it's based on the open air research graph, which is such a rich source, there are several ways to organize and view the data. Therefore, um, 
with discussions, uh, by discussions with us, we can create uh, different indicators that may be of more interest to you. Um, you can also invite your own team members to view and edit uh, the dashboard. And you can uh, separate uh, private indicators for internal monitoring and public indicators to show to external uh, stakeholders. Um, okay, so the idea is that uh, starting from the graph, uh, you provide us with some information. For example, a funder could provide the information of uh, the, the set of projects that they're interested in and their funding scheme. Um, and then we get the bolding, you can validate that the indicators and so on that you view are okay with you. And we set up your portal, which you can use to for your monitoring purposes. Uh, let me say at this point, by going back one slide, that uh, uh, right now we have, we're in the process of setting up some uh, funder uh, dashboard. You can already view the ECS dashboard, which is uh, public. And, um, but the service can also be used for institutions, uh, research infrastructures, uh, and other type of uh, stakeholders. So um, anybody who needs a monitoring uh, of their research activities, we are able to build their dashboard. All right. In the open air ecosystem, we are the nice thing in color here at the end. So after the data uh, pass to the all the different services and make them uh, reliable and open and wonderful, um, we are in the post processing part. Uh, at the end, another way to view it is uh, this way. This information is also available on the platform, and the. The takeaway uh, from here is, I think I went a bit too fast, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, that we are able to use the open air research graph with these um, usual updates and so on, in order to build a rich set of indicators that can track research activities for funders, institutions, and research infrastructures. Um, this is an on-demand service where you contact us in order to be able to set up uh, your monitoring dashboard the way that best fits your monitoring needs. And we have also added some functionalities that can allow uh, any stakeholder to use it for uh, reporting and uh, analysis. Uh, all in all, it ends up being a business intelligence uh, monitoring tool. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Anna. I think with monitoring, we complete a phase that we see that for many stakeholders, many needs, many users, many problems, we have solutions so far. So you identify uh, funders here, the institutions, uh, and it's uh, like uh, one, one prominent is also the European Commission that is using the Open Air Monitor Service. And... Uh, Thank you very much. And let's now move on to the next Q&A session. Uh, yes, most of the questions are being answered. So okay. um, yes. we are on, on time. Uh, <clears throat> one thing that monitor is uh, built uh, on top of the graph, but content from the graph, of course, can be taken by others who want to maybe run different kinds of experiments or extract different kind of information or double check that what we came up with uh, is effectively uh, resulting from the original data. So that's the idea. So uh, content is open for others to use and build different services, including of course companies or organizations, et cetera. And yes, and now as you can see, we have the same code uh, on Menti. So please use this code again. You see it also in the chat. And yes, yes. try to answer three more questions, please. So question number one. Which service you know or are familiar with, if you're familiar with any of the services that were presented now? And again, we, we would like to see more than 30 people, you know, participating. So we have quite good results. We can have an overview. 
we are almost half. It's also good for us to know uh, on where to focus on in the next, uh, let's say, events, uh, dissemination, and communication activities. For example, if usage comes is number is last, then we can say, okay, we can we can give you more info about it. Maybe you need to know more. Maybe uh, you know. It's something we, we can work on. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can, uh, yeah, let's wait three seconds, five, yeah, half 24, and we can move on to the next question, maybe. So which service do you use in your funder institution or organization or research community? So. Uh, Although they are different with different objectives, um, we don't know if you use any of them. Yes, there's a lot of people who doesn't use none. Yeah. So I suppose here, you know, researchers cannot answer clear because we need research communities, funders, organizations. None. Eh? Feel free to to open the microphone if you want to add some some information or just a comment or so clearly. Yeah. Okay, we can move on to the next question. Yes, and the big majority the same, doesn't yeah. use, yes. Yeah, and at the same time, you can, you know, write any question in the chat. Everything is recorded, so don't worry. You get your answer. Um, so in which way do you think this service could be useful on your daily activity? Okay, can we see the services? So it means that think again, your daily life, your work, your activities, what you have to do to present, to deliver, to finish. And how can you imagine that the last services that you saw, I will repeat them, uh, monitors, call explorer, open citations, open APC and usage count can be useful in your daily life, your daily activities. So there's a, a comment here from uh, Joe Havenman. He says, looks like Open Air Nexus is involved into a fully holistic research management system, fully compliable with all kinds of policy, European Commission and principles, open science. Is the European Commission already proactively recommending using open air services and now flexible? Adaptable and interoperable is the Nexus system to alternatives of individual services. Is the common goal to develop a fully interoperable global ecosystem and here we have a Eurocentric chapter or it for research management um, for the presenters or even for the Paulo? Uh, I don't know if someone wants to answer. Yes, I was typing in an answer. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I typed it in, but I can uh, expand. It's a great question. Uh, yes, of course, but we are uh, providing services as mature as possible. We're trying to make them uh, compliant with the uh, request from, from the specific stakeholders we are dealing with. But at the same time, the idea is to uh, build services that overall align with standards and interoperability frameworks uh, driven by uh, the needs of the community. So uh, I made an example here, but the idea is not that open air services will become the unique services serving the commission or they use for given certain, uh, to, to provide given functions, but that these services will be there it would be an opportunity for those who need to use them. We'll align to common interoperability frameworks decided together so that other services, maybe more specific to one or another community, can comply to the same interoperability frameworks. And uh, third party services can take advantage of that. Episcience is a good example. I can build an overlay journal, but still rely on several kinds of repositories out there. How can I do that? How can I build a system like Episcience without suffering too much? by relying on common interoperability frameworks, so data exchange, APIs, to which the individual data sources out there, in this case, Nodo, HAL, Archive, uh, can comply to. 
and this will be, uh, I think, the major driver behind the EOSC as a, as a collaborative effort in Europe, uh, enabling this kind of interactions by sitting down at the same tables and offering, of course, enabling services in the middle, like registries that allow me to find out which other services compliant with framework and build services that can take advantage of that. Yes, thank you so much, Paul. Uh, to have uh, have men answered again. We are working along the scheme, much smaller scale, with Africa Archive. Thanks for the response. Thank you so much. So um, maybe we could move on because we are a little bit uh, late. So um, now we're going to have a five minutes break. And then we come back again here to continue to show our Discover portfolio. So see you in five minutes.